fasten your seatbelts because we're going to have some severe turbulence and remain seated at all times. Rough crowd. They never laugh at anything. <laughs> never laugh. Hmm? Sense of humor, well, I don't know. It's only a problem in this state. An elephant joke? An elephant joke. An elephant joke. Well, I don't know any that are clean enough to have on tape. Elephant joke? Yeah. There's no unclean elephant. Oh, well. <laughs> I'll speak to you privately after that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I guess I was here, let's say, at least over a year ago. So a lot has happened, obviously, since then. Um, those of you who were here the last time, and maybe a couple of times before that, do remember, hopefully, that I told you there would be terrorist attacks in the United States. And I also told you that there would be the eventual uh, implementation of a martial law and eventually uh, splitting of the United States and a global government. You remember all of that. And so now we're well on our way to that. Remember the target date of all of this to come to a conclusion uh, for this particular agenda is the middle of 2003. So we only have 13, 14 months uh, left of uh, a semblance of uh, what you know of as the United States and, and the Earth, as far as you're concerned. Um, I want to give you a little bit of a background uh, to those of you who are not familiar with me. And there are some new people here. Um, I did work in the government for over 25 years. I was uh, spent 13 of those years at the Montauk Project uh, from 1970 to 1983. And that project did involve mind control, uh, genetic manipulation, and then moved on into other uh, bizarre experimentations as uh, time travel, weaponry, research, and weather control, which is well underway now and quite ex established. As for my history, why I was involved in this, uh, why me particularly, they look for people with certain type of genetics, people who have a predisposition for mental activities that you would call psychic or otherwise. Uh, also has to do with uh, my great uncle uh, being the first president of the Soviet Union and my family being involved in government activity on both sides of the Atlantic uh, ever since that time. My grandmother. Uh, was a Russian spy in World War II. Uh, and my grandfather was actually sent to this country to start the Communist Party in the United States, which he did in the 1920s and 30s. Um, and then uh, he disappeared somewhere in the 1960s. That's how I came to do this kind of work. Uh, when I was in Montauk uh, in 1983, that project crashed. And those of you who are interested in, in the details of that, um, you can read about that in the Montauk uh, Alien Connection book out there in the lobby. And tonight I want to discuss mostly the latest book that I have written called uh, Blue Blood, True Blood, Conflict and Creation, which is how many of you have read that book? Just a couple of you. And in that book I write about what I know as the true history of the Earth based on the information I received uh, during those 25 years working for the uh, people who control this planet. Um, there's a lot of history, if not almost 100% of history, and what you've learned in school that is completely false. Ideas, scenarios, events that have either been made up completely or that have been changed or altered in some way to fit the agenda of those who control the planet. I'm going to make a very, very long story short because uh, we don't have that much time to talk about things. And I do want to give you all an opportunity at the end to ask questions on any topic uh, that you want to ask. And I'm sure that some of you um, will be able to ask questions, those of you who are able to speak after I'm done. <laughs> I have to get some of uh, my excitement spray and put it around the room. I guess maybe you're tired after all week. but. Uh, Make a long and now the story, the the, uh, the history of the Earth, as you know, is millions of years old. In actuality, the story of human beings on the Earth is very short in comparison. It's less than a million years old. And 
the original colonists on this planet, again, I'm condensing a lot because you can read about it in that book, were reptilian beings. Reptilians represent about 25% of the population of this galaxy. Human life form represents about 70% of the life forms in this particular galaxy. And then 5% are other types of beings of various proportions. Now understand, even though that's only 5% as far as other type of creatures are concerned, if you think that in this galaxy alone there are an estimated 100 billion stars, and then extrapolate that to where in the physical universe there are approximately 100 billion galaxies. And if you do the math, it's astronomical, the number of star systems that exist. And if only one-tenth of one percent of all of those stars had intelligent life, that would still be millions of civilizations. And then times that by the infinite realities that exist. In other words, alternate universes. So it's mind-boggling to imagine how many different civilizations are out there. Interestingly enough, on this little planet, in this sector, um, there's only a couple of interactions compared to all those millions of civilizations, despite what you may have been told by some of the New Age information, which is mostly disinformation. And here again, those of you who've been with me before know the difference, and I'll explain for the new people. This, this different kinds of information, misinformation is simply misinterpreted knowledge or information that has not been uh, in, understood correctly, like an honest mistake. Disinformation is a lie sandwich. That's when you have a lie in the middle with two truths on the end, or two lies on the end and a truth in the middle, but you get hooked in by the truth part, and so you think that the whole rest of it is, is also true. And that's what the government uh, and all the governments of the earth do when they give that information to the public. It's always disinformation. Well, in my opinion, both are not the best, they're not good, either one of them, but the worst, I imagine, if you want to use that terminology, would be the disinformation, because it's purposely given so that you won't get the whole information. You won't understand it completely, and you'll get hooked and skewered in the wrong direction. So it's a deception. So in that, my opinion, that is the most incorrect of, of that uh, genre. Now, going back into history, this planet was actually uninhabitable, and it was occupying the second orbit around the sun, and it was an, a watery planet. And the human civilizations that existed in this galaxy originated in what is called the Lyrian star system. And I'll put that word up on the board for you, because you may hear it a lot in the future. The star system was called Lyrae. And for all intents and purposes, that was the home star system of all human life in this galaxy. And there is another star system that can be seen, I believe, from the southern hemisphere that is called Draco. And it was from here that the reptilian uh, civilizations or beings existed, and they actually attacked the Lyrian civilization and broke it up into many pieces. And the refugees of the Lyrian star system fanned out throughout this sector of the galaxy and occupied a lot of the star systems that are within uh, this particular sector. Now, if you look at our galaxy, about the Milky Way galaxy, it kind of looks like a pinwheel, like that. And this particular solar system that we are in occupies one little point on the tip of one of the arms that reaches out into deep space. So that if you were an invasion force and sought to occupy an entire galaxy, and you came upon a shape like this, the most logical thing for you to do would be to occupy all the various points, thereby surrounding the entire inner portion of the galaxy, and the portion of the galaxy, and then you can take your time working your way in because in effect you already won. So that is what the Dracos have done, or the Draconians have done. And they occupied the Earth first. They were the very first 
colonists on this planet. And in fact, it was their actions that changed the Earth from a water world to one that had inhabitable land masses. And this was close to one million years ago. Now, I understand that many of what has been given to you in science as far as uh, carbon dating and fossil dating, dinosaurs being tens and hundreds of million years old, well, most of that is incorrect. If you understand the science of carbon dating, it is very uh, faulty. And it depends on certain atmospheric conditions, and it also depends on the type of uh, soil that the uh, bones are, are buried in. And in fact, what may appear at some points to be tens of millions of years old may be in effect only a few thousand years old in, in actuality. So eventually this information will be given to, out to the public uh, when a new revision of history is given to you towards the end of next year, officially. And so the Draco occupied this planet first. Human refugees from the Lyrian star system came here many thousands of years later. And there were many clashes between the two because reptilian and mammalian life forms are not conducive to living together. They need different environment, they need different type of food, they need different type of uh, culture, and they don't mix. So there was always conflict. And at one point it was decided that there would be some type of effort to, to stop the fighting and to merge the two sides together. And this is what the Bible talks about in the chapter Genesis. Now understand the Bible is not to be taken literally. It is, it is a, a, an allegory. It is a coded history that needs to be deciphered. All of the stories that you read in there may not necessarily have happened the way they're written. It is there as a code. And if you go into the original uh, Aramaic language, uh, in which it was written, it was not written in Hebrew, but it was written in Aramaic. There is a code that then can be deciphered, and we've only been able to decipher it in the last few years through the use of computer programming. And in fact, right in the code, in the old Aramaic and ancient Hebrew in there, it says, can only be deciphered through use of computer. Where computer is clearly written in the code. Now, who wrote that? 4,000 years ago. So it was obviously not written by people as you know it. They decided to make a third race of people, one that would be considered native to the earth. And the deal was that they would mix reptilian with human genetics to create a new race. Now, the reptilians were androgynous. That means there was male and female within the same body. There was not a separation of sexes. And so in order to create this third race, the reptilians only agreed to it if a reptilian body was used first and human genetics were added to it. And this is why in the Bible it says, let us make man in our image. It's plural. And in the Old Testament, all references to God are plural, as if it were more than one. And that's why it says, let us make man in our image. And the story of Eve being created from the rib of Adam is an allegorical story of an androgynous reptilian body being separated into male and female components. That is the allegorical or symbolical story of that particular chapter. And scientifically, you can prove this, any of you who are in the medical profession. All you have to do is look at how a human fetus gestates in the womb. And you will see that it starts out reptilian-like, and then as it develops, it becomes more human-like in the second and third trimester. And so this is what actually is occurring. The genetics are opening up in the sequences in which they were formated. It was reptilian first, human genetics were added to that, so during the station period, that is what formulates. That's just plain as day. Now, what happened was, and this is almost comical when you think about it, although it's really not funny, 
that when each side donated the genetics to create this new race, they programmed their genetics to be dominant over the other. So that there's always conflict within your own body. That's why your brain is split into left and right hemispheres. That's why you have a reptilian brain and a mammalian brain. That's why you have a reptilian lymphatic system and you have also skin that wrinkles and peels, as well as other mammalian factors. You are all hybrids of reptilian and human genetics. That's what makes civilization on this planet so unique because that doesn't exist anywhere else in this galaxy. And that's why there is so much interest in this planet from elsewhere, not only within this physical universe, but also in alternate universes. Whether or not you accept it, there is not just one universe. There are many different universes all occupying the same uh, structure, if you will. It's kind of like having a radio, and no matter where you tune the frequencies, different stations play. So it's kind of like the different stations within the radio of God mind, if you want to look at it that way. Yes? I have a question then. Um, the embryos of uh, animals, like dogs, mammalian animals, like dogs, cats, don't they have also reptilians? Yes, many of them do. do they have right and left hemispheres? Many of them do, and that's because all life form on this planet was either brought here or created here under those special circumstances. There is no nat natural life to this planet. And, then, and that's another point. And that is, when a creature, or when, when, a, when a being is native to its environment, the environment is benevolent to it. Life isn't a struggle, otherwise life could not have existed or been developed. Life on this planet is alien to it. This planet is innately hostile to life. If left on its own, no life would have formed here. It's either too cold or too hot, too watery, too dry, too rocky. There's always a reason why life would not exist on its own on this world. This planet is actually an alien world to you. Nobody came from here. So in effect, you are aliens on this planet, and you are aliens of your own mind. And this again is a unique situation in this particular part of the galaxy want to jump ahead a few thousand years, and that is the two civilizations that occupied this planet at the time, the reptilian and the human, were in what you would term uh, Lemurian or Atlantean. That is the common terms that have been used since then. And there was war between the two. And in fact, <clears throat> I have a translation here of ancient uh, Indian Vedas, or <coughs> texts, that are at least 100,000 years old and have been translated, and they describe the war between Lemuria and Atlantis. They also describe the use of weapons that, through the description, could only have been nuclear weapons or devices, as they do talk about mushroom clouds and light that obliterates physical reality. They also talk about lances or flying spheres things that you would call UFOs or flying aircraft or even missiles. All of this has been translated in, uh, from the uh, ancient uh, Veda. And they also talk about uh, ships called Vimana or Astra, which are vehicles that can fly into the air and even outside of the atmosphere. This was written 100,000 years ago. And you should also know that the ancient Indian civilization, or the Hindu civilization, is actually an offshoot or a derivation or descendancy of the original Lemurian colonies in what is now the Pacific. Now, what happened? The Atlanteans, or those refugees from Lyrae, actually had devices that could harness the geomagnetic forces of the Earth and pull it or force it into a specific location. And when they did this, when it was too powerful, it could break the upper it could break the upper mantle or crust of the earth and cause it to split and fall in. And that's what they did with Lemuria. They actually used that as a weapon 
to destroy that continent and make it sink into what now is called the Pacific Ocean. The only remnants of Lemuria that exist above the water, the largest piece is what was, is now Australia and New Zealand, but also uh, Hawaii, Japan, Taiwan, the Philippines, all of the South Pacific Islands, as well as California west of the San Andreas Fault Line. The San Andreas Fault Line is a continental uh, split or, or, or section between two continental plates. Theoretically, it shouldn't be mostly in the ocean. They should be all together. And so what's left of the western part of California is actually uh, the edge or coastline of what was Lemuria. Now, what I didn't tell you also is uh, planetary uh, geology, which is a long story, but I'll make it very short, and that is all planets that are formed through the ejection of molten material from a star, like our planet was from the sun, are hollow. And the reason they are hollow is because as this molten material is thrown from the sun and starts spinning in space, it starts to cool, and because it's cooling and spinning, it forms into a globular shape, and the outside starts to harden. But as above, so below. Inside, the molten material is also spinning. And as it spins, centrifugal force forces it to the sides. And as it's forced to the sides, it gets pushed out of openings that appear at what would be the poles. And so, then the inside becomes cool as, as uh, the molten material exits, and then the inside layer starts to harden and cool. So what, in effect, you have is you have a globe with two openings. The inside portion or well, the very center has what is what's left of the molten material through gravitational forces suspended in the center of the globe. And in between the outer and inner crusts is the molten material that is trapped between the two hardened layers. And on both sides, plates form or cracks form as they shift. And that's when you have fault lines and even volcanoes form that push out the the molten material. And in fact, planetary science has shown that at the 19th parallel of all such planets are volcanic activity. On the Earth, it shows on the Hawaiian Islands, uh, the west coast of South America, southeastern Asia, and even across to Africa. On Mars, the largest volcano in this solar system, the Mons Volcano, is located at the 19th parallel. And on Jupiter, the red spot on Jupiter is located at the 19th parallel. This is planetary science of any kind of structure that is thrown from its sun. That's why the Earth actually is hollow. And that's why if this is called the inner Earth, and this is the surface. And that's why in the Bible it says it talks about creatures on the Earth and in the Earth. That's what it's talking about. Now, in between the outer and inner crusts or, or surface areas, there are fractures that have existed or cave or tunnel systems that have formed naturally and some not so naturally that connect the two sides together. The opening at the North Pole is about 1,300 miles wide, and the opening at the South Pole is 950 miles wide, except this is covered in ice and snow. This one is wide open. And in fact, Admiral Byrd, when he went to the North Pole back in the 1920s, as he approached the North Pole, actually saw open waters, tropical flowers and plants floating in that water, and what you would consider tropical or prehistoric animals like mammoths, still at the very edge of this opening. And that is why aircraft are not allowed to fly directly over the North Pole. It has nothing to do with magnetic disturbances, it has to do with they don't want you to see what's there. Plus, the aurora borealis is nothing more than this molten material suspended in the center radiating out and causing uh, the effect of the aurora borealis under certain conditions. It has nothing to do with radiations from the sun. All of that is false science. And very soon they'll be giving you this information. 
just like I told you two and three years ago when I was here, that in 2000, 2001, 2002, they're going to start giving you information based on not only the Earth, but their actual secret government. And what's happened in the last six months? They told you there are underground bases. They told you there's a shadow government. They told you yesterday they knew there was going to be an attack. They're telling you everything because they want you to know now. They want you to know so that it will induce fear in you and you will pay attention to whatever they say. When someone holds all the cards and they're going to win, you want to be on their good side. That's the idea behind it. But I'll get to that in a moment. So this is planetary structure. When Lemuria sank into the ocean, or actually sank into the upper surface or upper crust of this area, many of the survivors or refugees of that continent went into the inner Earth where they exist to this very day. And that began the ancient rumors of hell and fire underneath the Earth and demonic creatures that live under the Earth. That's where those ancient myths and rumors got started, is when the reptilians had to go inside the Earth in order to survive. Now, the reptilians are very patient creatures. And they have an air or feeling of superiority about them as it pertains to humans or mammalians. And there's reasons why. Reptilians, as I mentioned to you, are androgynous. They have male and female in the same body. When you go outside a physical reality, you know that there is no gender. It's just energy, not male or female, just energy. So in their mindset, they feel that they incorporate this God-mind-like understanding already in physical reality, making them superior to mammalian creatures who have to split into male and female. To them, that's more separation. That's one reason. Second thing is, and you can notice this on the Earth right now, reptilian DNA does not change or alter very much over millions of years. It stays pretty much constant. Whereas mammalian genetics must adapt and change and evolve constantly in order to survive, and most times doesn't. So to the reptilian mindset, that makes mammalians inferior because they need to adapt and change all of the time. Whereas if you are perfect, you don't have to change anymore. So in their mindset, they feel superior over Mammalians. Now, it doesn't make it right or wrong. I'm just explaining to you how they think. And because of that, they can take a lot of time to accomplish what they feel they need to accomplish. Time is meaningless to them because they know they are unchanging and their agenda will always be current. Whereas human civilizations will rise and fall and disappear, theirs will remain constant. So they're very patient with what they have to do. And that is why their agenda for this planet, and particularly this country, has its end date as 2003. And they started that thousands of years ago. Now is the time for it to come to a completion. And so, the Atlanteans, despite what you may have read in Sedona Journal and all the other knowledge information you probably read, the Atlanteans were not very nice people either. The Atlanteans performed horrible genetic experimentations. They mixed human genetics with dolphin genetics and created what you have learned to be known as a merfolk or mermaid and mermen. There are three pockets of those beings that still exist on the Earth. One of them is off the coast of the outer islands of South Carolina. The other pocket is in the Bay of Fundy in Nova Scotia. And the third is off the New Hebrides Islands in Scotland. And to this very day, in all three locations, sightings of these type of creatures still exist. They also created what you know as Bigfoot or Sasquatch by mixing their genetics with human genetics. Those still exist also in some pockets on the Earth. And they also created an ancient uh, mythological creature that evoked fear even to this very day, and that is the werewolf. And they simply did that by mixing wolf genetics with human. And that actually led to the story of the creation of Rome in the Roman Empire, who claimed that their descendants were twins born of a wolf mother. Twins born of a wolf mother. And so that's where that story comes from. 
All these stories, all of these myths, both Greek, Roman, and Babylonian, etc., have a basis in fact because they're based on actual occurrences. To this very day, there are humans who are born with webbed hands and feet or extra fingers and toes. These are all throwbacks to the ancient Atlantean genetic experimentation, which is still in existence to this very day genetically. And so the Atlanteans, in their zeal to control everything, also destroyed their own continent by manipulating the geomagnetic force underneath their continent. And they collapsed over three different cataclysms into what is now the Atlantic Ocean. All that is left of the Atlantean continent is Bermuda, most of the Caribbean islands, and uh, Azores and the Canaries. Uh, most of the rest is submerged. And in fact, recently, and I believe it was summer of 2001, a uh, submarine working on for US research, geological research, was uh, going through the mid-Atlantic range uh, south of Bermuda where there's this tremendous trench with very high mountains, and they photographed what they said looked like skyscrapers. Of course, they said it was most likely natural formation over millions of years and sediment built up and coral built up. But when you saw the picture, and I, I didn't bring it with me, but it looks just like what you would think of Manhattan under, under the ocean. And, and so little by little, they reveal this information to you. And um, what happened with the Atlanteans? Those who survived went to what is now Egypt, Greece, North America, and South America, and parts of uh, Central America. And in Central America, it's very interesting because there they mixed with the remnants of the Lemurians. And there was created the um, Inca Empire um, in especially Central and Western South America. Now, contrary to scientific opinion, the American Indians and South American Indians didn't one day decide to leave China and walk across the Bering Straits of Alaska and down North America and to South America. That just did not happen. First of all, their shoes would have worn out a long time before they reached there. Very rough crowd. <coughs> Next time you come, you got to take some laugh spray. <laughs> and does it even make sense because under that logic, the Indians of South America would have arrived there last, correct? The last location. Then why is it that location had the most advanced civilization? Wouldn't that have taken longer to exist than, let's say, the Eskimos in Alaska? Wouldn't they have the most advanced? <coughs> they were the first ones there, and they have no civilization. It doesn't hold water at all, because it wasn't true. And so even uh, if you go around the Pacific, you will find uh, curiosities. For example, in New Zealand, you will find uh, in the rural areas stone temples of very high degree and roads that lead from mountainous areas and then end underwater into the Pacific as if they were continuing on. But of course, uh, no one knows where they end. And Hawaii. Here's a very interesting thing about Hawaii. The government recently sent out a warning to people. And it said that imminently there would be a vast volcanic eruption in Hawaii, but so powerful that it would create a magnificent earthquake. And the earthquake would cause gravitation or gravity to be 1.75 times that of the normal, because the, the ground bolting up and down so rapidly. Under that circumstances, nothing will remain standing in Hawaii. So when people say to me, well, I'm going to run away from North America and I'm going to go live in Hawaii, not a good idea. Because even the government is warning about that one. And it's imminent, and it will create vast tidal waves that will affect all sides of the Pacific Ocean. But here's the good news. Hawaii is not sinking, it's rising up. So if you were able to survive that blast, most likely you'll be able to, to live past that because you'll be above ocean. But in that same warning, which was absolutely fascinating to me, in that same warning, the government said that Hawaii was once part of a larger volcanic island that now was submerged. The first time 
they ever admitted to the possibility of Lemuria. So that was very fascinating. Part of the dissemination of information program that they're giving you between now and 2003. You have also heard about a 12th planet. It's really not a 12th planet, but you know Zachariah Sitchin's work of the 12th planet, who, by the way, and I, I will just say it, uh, I always get myself in trouble, but Zachariah Sitchin is, is a disinformant. Um, I think he started out okay, but uh, I met him in, in Switzerland four years ago, and he gave a lecture, and the same place I was given a lecture, and he totally turned around everything he was saying. He denied everything. So something happened there. And uh, long story, but just know that whatever he's saying now isn't exactly the truth. But there is a planet which is really a vehicle. Now, you have heard it called uh, Marduk, but some civilizations call it Nuburu. That seems to be the more popular word these days. And it has an elliptical orbit around the sun that passes by the Earth every 3,600 years. Now, people thought that was fantasy and that this was all based on the translations of Sumerian tablets uh, from thousands of years ago. Well, lo and behold, January 2001, LA Times, New York Times, front page. NASA has discovered a large planetary body beyond Pluto, which has an orbit contrary to all other planets around the Sun, and that based on the present trajectory, it will be in the vicinity of the Earth by mid-2003. That was the last news release on that. New York Times, right? Everything in the paper is true, right? right? So that's what they released. And so, here's what they do for their legalities. They have released information one time, and in a way that most people don't pay attention to it, so that should something come up in the future where they said, hey, you should have told us about this, well, here it is. We told you. It was this big. And it was, it was only one day, but we said it, posted it. Just like when you go to a lawyer and, you have to sell, and, you, and you're looking to settle an estate or what have you, they say, post it in the newspaper. If nobody ever reads it, you did it. Same kind of thing. Same principle behind it. And we're seeing more and more of that uh, these days. What happens now? No more Atlantis, no more Lemurian. The reptilians under the earth, the Atlanteans scattered kind of a free-for-all. A lot of other civilizations, mostly Lurian-based, come and start genetically altering different various human populations. And so the reptilians underneath the Earth felt it was their time to come to the surface and start retaking it. But they did it in such a way that it was insidious and quiet. And it was through more hybridization. Humans already were hybrids, reptilian human, but their features were predominantly human. So if after all this time, a purebred reptilian came to the surface, that would cause horror and fear. So they couldn't do that. They had to create further hybridization, and they started with the Sumerian civilization in what is now Iraq, or southern Iraq. And in fact, very much close to and including what is now Kuwait. And so they started with the civilization called Sumer. And if you look in history books or art books under the god and goddess of Sumer, you will see that the god and goddess were Nimrod and Samirimus. This is the god and goddess. Now, why do you think reptilian beings would have a god-goddess as a deity? Why wouldn't it just be a god or just a goddess? Because they're androgynous. And in order to get that into mammalian symbology, they need a male and female component of the one god. So they have god and goddess. And if you look up Nimrod and Samirimus, what they look like? They look like reptilians.
They look like reptilians. They look like human form with the reptilian head and hands and feet holding the human baby. That was the god and goddess of Sumer. Now, reptilians have copper-based blood. What do humans have? Iron-based blood. What color is iron when it oxidizes? Red or brownish red. What color is copper when it oxidizes? Green and blue, blue-green. And so, when the reptilians hybridized the certain humans in Sumer, and those became the leaders, they were called the Blue Bloods. Because the Blue Bloods had copper-based blood, and when they oxidized or bled, it looked blue-green. So all the elite and all of the god goddesses and priests were called Blue Bloods. That's where the term comes from. That's where the title of my book comes from. Those then spread out or actually became Babylon. The Babylonians moved to Khazar, which is in the Caucasus Mountains of what is now Russia. And the Caucasus Mountains gives you the name Caucasian. That's where Caucasian people are supposed to have originated. But they are the descendants of Sumer, the Khazars. Now, interestingly enough, last year, an a university in Italy did a test of 800 European men, genetic tests. 80% of them came back with ancestry to Khazar, or no matter what country they were from. And the other 20% showed a Middle Eastern background. So in effect, all come from the same place. The Khazar spread out into Asia and Europe and the Middle East, bringing their reptilian-like religion with them. All of the reptilian religions are based on the number three. The reason it's based on the number three is because the reptilians worship a three-horned god. That's what they worship. That's their symbol. Nimrod and Semiramis, the symbol was a trident. And in Greece, it was also a trident. And in Egypt, what was it? Also, three-forked object. This went into Egypt, Greece, and even to ancient Israel. This was about 7,000 years ago when it started to spread out. Understand that Atlantis sank in 10,500 BC, approximately, and about 3,000 years later is when this civilization started to emerge because of the hybridization that started to come from underground. And this is what's going on. In fact, where, what's, where is Afghanistan? Afghanistan is in also the same general region. And what do they tell you about Afghanistan? There are cave systems and tunnel systems deep and spread out all over the place. That's part of the original tunnel systems that I told you about that lead into the inner earth. They don't pick a spot by accident. They pick it because it's on purpose. And I'm going to get into that more. Suffice to say, and I'm making a very long story short, in Egypt, this god became known as Osiris and Isis. In Greece, it became Apollo and Athena. And in ancient Israel, yes, it became Jesus and Mary. That was the god goddess. All based on the number three, whether it's a cross or a trinity or a trident or a triangle, whatever was used always had number three associated with it. And we're seeing that more and more. Uh, in uh, modern times, in fact, in fact, when your president, which I'm sure you all voted for him, when he took office after that fake election, what did he give everybody 
as a little symbol when he took office. A little three-horned god. And, and the caption says, I have the original over there, it says, that's a salute. He gave the crowd a salute. That's a three-horned god. Is Reptilian Antlers a salute? He is a reptilian. He's a shapeshifter. I didn't get to that part yet. And, uh, oh, look, there's other thing here I want to show you. The other thing that they do Ah, here it is. I don't know if you can see it very clearly. But Clinton did this also in his um, inauguration. It's called the Devil's Salute. They go like this. They, this is the horns of the devil. This is the face of the devil. And they go like that. And this is Clinton here doing that. And if you go through every inauguration, every inauguration, there's a picture of every one of the presidents doing this. Every single one of them. And in fact, uh, Prince William was it, when he was in South America, and he was showing how humble he was. He was on somebody's yacht, I think, scrubbing a toilet bowl. And CNN came, and they said, do you have any, any do you want to say hello to Grandma, the Queen? And he said, oh, yes. And he goes like this to the camera. So, even, it, it goes through all the Illuminati. And in fact, um, all of these were genetically re-engineered for specific purposes. And that's a very complicated subject that we won't have time to get into today, but I do talk about it somewhat in the new book. Um, you should also be aware that the name Jesus is not the original name. That came centuries later. The original name of the person was Emmanuel. And Emmanuel um, claimed, because he didn't die on the cross, that whole thing was a staged, set-up situation, the crucifixion. And in fact, in 1963, there was a Palestinian professor who, in Jerusalem, uncovered by a church, resin-encased uh, cylinders. And when he opened them up, they had parchment that hadn't been opened in over 2,000 years. And it was written in Aramaic. And he translated those parchments and apparently had been written by a man who claimed to be the son of Emmanuel. And in those documents it said that Emmanuel married Mary Magdalene and had three, three children with her and staged the crucifixion and was drugged, put up on the cross, taken down, antidote given, and he and the oldest son were sent to India, where his grave can be seen to this very day. If you go to India, to the province of Kashmir, to the city of Srinagar, you will see in the cemetery a grave that says, in, in that local language, here is the grave of Emmanuel of Israel. And next to the grave is his mother, Mary, or actually her name was Miriam, not Mary. And so on this tombstone it said he lived to be 117. And I think Mary was 90-something uh, when she passed away, I remember that part. And interestingly enough, Kashmir province to this very day, you read about it every day in the newspaper, it's on CNN, battle between India and Pakistan, who controls it? Battle all the time. All the spots that are important are under warfare so that you don't go there, so that you don't find out for yourself. But should you able, be able to get to Kashmir, um, I did get ma manage to get to Kashmir in 1999, but with the, day, the second I got there, India attacked uh, Pakistan uh, rebels and killed uh, quite a number. I talk about it in the book. Um, so no exploration possible. Anyway. Mary Magdalene and the two children went by boat to the south of France, where to this very day the villages in those areas reenact her arrival by boat to this very day. And she took up residence in the south of France in a cave system, and then her descendants uh, multiplied, mixed with the people there. And what is not taught in American history, but is taught in European, especially French history, is that for a number of centuries, 
the southern part of France was France was actually a Hebrew kingdom whose official religion was Judaism. And Joseph, the brother of uh, Emmanuel, actually went to the British Isles, taking many relics of uh, his existence with him, which is occupied or owned to this day by the British royal family. Those were kept in Balmoral Castle. Now, what happened? Juxtaposition. The symbol of Emmanuel and Mary was the lion, a gold lion, like the Lion of Judah. That's where it comes from. In the year 800, the Khazars all converted en masse to Judaism. And the reason they did this was so that they would not be under the control of the then expanding Holy Roman Empire, which then was a Christian empire. And so the Khazars spread into Europe and actually created the downfall of the Roman Empire. And they mixed with the local tribes and civilizations who then occupied Europe, mixing the bloodline of the Khazars, whose symbol was the dragon, with the people whose symbol was the lion. And, that, and the first ones to do this was King Nerovi. And he became, their lineage became known as the Merovingians, the mixture between the Magdalene lineage and the reptilian lineage. And to this very day, the new symbol is what? That you see on all of the uh, European uh, uh, posts and, and official buildings and city gates is a reptilianized lion. And you see the lion, it looks like it has, it's really like a dragon, but it's, yeah, it's still a lion. You've, you've, just, you've seen them. Every Italian restaurant has one. And so that was the merger of the Magdalene lineage with the uh, reptilian lineage. And henceforth, the blue bloods became the nobility of Europe, which they are to this very day. Again, making a very long story short, these people then broke into 13 families or ruling families that controlled all of the known world at the time, including the Vatican. And in fact, in the year 1213, the British royal family, now keep this in, in your mind as I go through this, this history, and I know I'm convincing a lot, but we don't have a lot of time. But in 1213, the British royal family signed a document handing over ownership of all of the assets of the British Empire to the Vatican, under the condition that forevermore the British royal family would be the administrators of that asset, but the Vatican would own it. Did you ever wonder why last year, when President Bush and all the other world leaders went to Genoa to the G8 meeting, that right after the meeting, he didn't come to the US and tell you what he did, but he went first to the Vatican and spoke to the Pope. I guess he had to tell him what will happen with his assets. Anyway, you should also know that because of that, the British administer the United States. Because the United States is not a country, it's a corporation. Formed in 1607 in London, by the name of the Virginia Corporation. And therefore, everything in the United States is actually an asset administered by the British royal family and owned by the Vatican. And if you look on the law books, you will see from over 200 years ago, it says that the US Postal Service is actually owned by the Bank of London, which is owned by the British royal family or administered by them. And that from henceforth, and this is from the 1700s, all US postage stamps shall cost 2.5 cents. And any other amount shall go to profit to the Bank of London. And if you post that rule of law on an envelope to this very day, you can mail any envelope for two and a half cents. I have received such envelopes and they have been delivered to me. 
They have to because it's the law. But you don't know the law. So you, they get away with everything. That's why in another month it's going to be 37 cents. See? So that means 34 and a half cents are going to the Bank of London. Not to the U.S. Post. Well, I think they're bankrupt. They don't have any money. They don't get that. See? It's a private corporation. Just like the IRS is a private corporation. Just like the Federal Reserve Bank is a private Delaware corporation. Federal Reserve Bank was started in 1930, no, 1913 by uh, your president's grandfather. He also started uh, the IRS in 1933 with two of his friends in New York City, Prescott Bush. And the idea for starting the Internal Revenue Service is to raise money for the Nazi party in Germany, which they did, and to which they transferred funds all through the 1930s. 1913, they started the Federal Reserve Bank, which is a privately held corporation, still owned by certain few individuals, except because it has the word federal in it, you think that it's the government, and it has nothing to do with the government. You should also know, in the IRS, when you sign your tax form for the very first time when you get a job and you're going to sign that, it's called special law. It is not federal law. Special law because it's outside of the normal law. It's a contract that you sign, and if you read it, it says, once you sign this, forevermore you will do this. If you don't, you break the contract that's punishable legally. That's what it says. Under no circumstances is income tax, federal income tax, legal. You're paying it to private individuals who then fund various governments with the money to do their bidding. That's what this group is about. They call themselves the Illuminati. In Latin, it means the illuminated ones or the wise ones. If you look it up in the internet, you'll find that the word Illuminati will give you an organization formed May 1st, 1776 in Bavaria by a man with the name of Adam Weishaupt. And if you look at his picture, he looks awfully a lot like George Washington. Something I just read about him? He was a Jesuit. Yeah. Jesuits are the military uh, aggressive branch of the Catholic Church. Uh, in fact, in Switzerland, they're banned. It's against the law to, ha to have Jesuits there. Um, and in many countries, uh, because they forcefully try to convert people against their will, and still do. Of course, the Catholic Church is about to be dismantled, and that was also, um, in fact, something I had written about uh, in 1992 uh, for this, this time period. In fact, within six months, you will see people burning churches to the ground and uh, dismantling things. In fact, they're already shooting priests. We just had this two months ago here. Is that right? Yeah, kid, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. very well. Mm -hmm. kid. Most likely, mind controlled and programmed to do that. And that was done with the Montauk Project, which I'll get to uh, hopefully soon. I wanted to give you a background of what religion is really all about. You also need to know that even the ancient Hebrew religion was an artificial religion. It was based on the Egyptian ceremonial reptilian cult. For example, in ancient Egypt, the word for crocodile fat was mesa. M-E-S-S-E-A in English, E-H in English. Mesa, what the ancient Egyptian priests used to do in their private ceremonies when they anointed someone or elevated them to priest status was anoint their body with crocodile fat, and it was called the Mesa. In Hebrew, it became Moshiach, or in English, Messiah. It really means he who is anointed with crocodile fat. That's what it means. <laughs> what it means. Just like I get a big kick out of people who tell me that they're channeling Melchizedek, or that they're on the Melchizedek frequency, or they're on the Melchizedek something or another. That comes from ancient Hebrew words, Melech Tzedek, which means charitable king. It was a title like you'd have minister, def defense minister. It was passed, the title was passed down from father to son. And if you were a Melchizedek, it meant you were a, an associate who helped the king get 
done what he had to get done. See? So that's like, if someone tells me they're of the Melchizedek priesthood, that would be their priesthood. That would be like in 5,000 years from now, someone says, I am channeling the Republicans, or I am channeling, <laughs> you know, the Minister of Defense, I'm getting <coughs> messages. Same thing, it's, if, if the ancient Hebrews were here, they'd be rolling on the floor laughing about the whole thing. Okay. And so, uh, we have to speed things up a little bit, because they're going to get the hook. Break? I, I, don't, I don't need a break. Do you need a break? Or do you need a break? Otherwise, we'll never get done. Okay. All right? Uh, and so, you have to shut me up, otherwise I won't shut up. And so, be careful about what you believe in, because most of it is not what you think it is. And in a couple of years from now, you're going to look very foolish. They're going to implement, one year from now, a new world religion. In fact, in fact, the last time I was, uh, a couple of times ago in Chicago, I received a pamphlet. Oh no, actually this was on the East Coast. I, I saw a pamphlet from the Theosophical Society, which is based around here. Mm -hmm. And the Theosophical Society, which is connected to the UN, has a big pamphlet now that says, prepare for the New World Religion. They're handing that out now at, at their organization. That will include a god and a goddess. They will actually have a new Christ figure, which they will call Emmanuel. And who do you think the female figure or the female icon will be? Diana. Diana. That's why she has been set up as a goddess, complete with glass coffin and private island for viewing. So we're back to a polytheistic religion again? Yes and no. I'll, let me get to that. In fact, just a few months ago, a woman released a book that she channeled, and she channeled Diana. The second that she died, this Diana went to this woman and started talking to her. And Diana told her that in a past life, she was the grandmother of Jesus, making her right away the Holy Mother of the Earth. So, there you go. She's already set up as the Holy Mother with Emmanuel, and very shortly, if not imminently, people will start seeing images of Diana appear to them, along with the Madonna, because they're really going to be uh, mother and daughter, aren't they? And so, that's already started happening. Now, people have said, well, if Christ comes back, how are you going to prove it, that it's him? There's already Baptist groups and uh, charismatic Christians who are claiming or demanding that now that cloning is available, they want to clone Christ. And the newspapers have accommodated this, by the way. And they said, you know what? We figured out that if Christ was cloned, based on the genetics of that time, he's not going to look like what you think he's going to look like. And in the newspaper, they actually sent a picture and said, this is what Jesus is going to look like. This was in newspapers on the East Coast. I don't know if they were on the West Coast. I don't know if they were here. I saw a documentary. Yeah, that was a documentary. And so they're showing you already what the, new cl the clone person is going to be like. They're telling you. This is him, see? Computer generated. Well, here's the next thing. Here's the next thing. How will they prove that it's him? What's the big buzz word that people use now? DNA, right? Prove it. Oh, yes, you do. Oh, yes, you do. Where do you know it? Shroud of Turin. Ah, but wait a second. For decades, they said the Shroud of Turin was a hoax. It was done in the Middle Ages, right? However, the technology to do it then didn't exist. Then all of a sudden, in, uh, in the midst of all that hubbub, the Church of Turin had a fire, and the Shroud mysteriously disappeared. Where did it turn up two years later? Jerusalem. And who had it but Israeli scientists? And what did they say? They said they examined the Shroud of Turin 
And in it, they found the pollen samples that were at least 2,000 years old and could only have come from the Middle East of that time, thereby verifying the authenticity of the Shroud of Tered, including the bloodstains on it. So if you take the bloodstains and you match that DNA to this guy, they're going to be a match. So what would the public say when this person's genetics is identical to the Shroud of Tered? What will people say? It's God. It's Jesus. And what's Jesus going to say? That the New World Order is my new holy empire. And Diana, my grandmother, is the mother of the world. And who's going to say no? And what happens if you do say no? Well, what happened last week? What did they do last week for the first time, which I warned you about three years ago? And everybody laughed at me. What did they do in Florida last Friday? We could go today. You do read newspapers in Winfield, don't you? They implanted the first human beings, at least officially, with chips, microchips. The first human beings, supposedly, but we know that's been going on for a long time. And now, what did Condoleezza Rice say? Well, she said, if you're at the airport security, and you're on this long line for two hours, and then right next to you, you see someone walking by with their arm like this to a machine and then just keep going, what line are you going to want to be on? That's what she said. The ICAST line. Yeah, <laughs> just stick it in there. And you, know, you don't even need your passport, you don't need your wallet, nothing. Just stick your arm. And then it's going to come to a point where if you don't get that, what are you hiding? What did Bush say? Either you're with me or you're against me. You cannot think for yourself. You can only do what I tell you, otherwise you're a terrorist. So if you don't get that, what are you hiding? That's coming next. They've already, in New York City, decided to implant newborn infants with it because they've been, been having kidnappings from the hospital. So what mother wouldn't want a lowjack in her baby? <laughs> what kind of a mother are you that you'd let your kid out like that without a chip? Yes, yes, absolutely. In imprinting into your mind that this is a necessity and requirement. Remember how they operate. Create the situation and then provide the solution that you want, only make the public think they wanted it. Exactly. And that, isn't that what they said a week after September 11th? Yes. Isn't that when they interviewed everybody on CNN in the streets, wouldn't you give up the Constitution and the Bill of Rights if, for security? Absolutely. Them. They couldn't say yes fast enough. And what have they said on television recently? Because people started questioning the, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the legality of this. On television they said the Bill of Rights and the Constitution are documents that are signed. All signed documents are legal documents. All legal documents are subject to negotiation. That's what they said. So, means there is no negotiation. Okay? Because then you're either you with me or you're against me. Now, they just admitted to you that they knew about the terrorist attacks before it happened. What they don't show you is on French television, on French television, they are saying that the President of the United States and the government set the whole thing up and that all, they're all lying. Mm -hmm. Of course, what happened to some of the people who believed in that in the French elections recently? They're out. And so, leads me to the next important point, and that is what happened on September 11th. What was that all about? Now, I must say that President Bush uh, deserves an Emmy Award because he really played it well. Complete with the tears and the nervousness and all that stuff. Of course, he doesn't really have to go too far to act. Um, 
You know, they did ask him uh, a few weeks ago what his favorite book was. Did you hear about that? They asked him what his favorite book was ever. He said, oh, when he was a little boy, his favorite book was The Hungry favorite book was The Hungry Caterpillar. Except the only problem is, that book wasn't written until after he was out of college. <laughs> so, he still doesn't get the plot, and he's waiting, he's waiting for them to make a movie about it so he can, he can watch that. But yes, uh, that's, that's quote, direct quote, and I just couldn't pass that one up. And another thing you should know, that several weeks before the September 11th attack, the leaders of the Taliban visited Bush in his Texas ranch. It was in the news. Was it? And he gave them $30 million a day. Now, what's up with that ranch anyway? Why do all world leaders all of a sudden have to visit him in the Texas ranch? Perhaps it has a nicer ceremonial ritual room than the White House does. Now, I received information from somebody I know in Texas and Austin just a couple of days ago, and I can't tell you how they found out about it, but it's, I know that it's good information. And they said they know of workers, Mexican workers, who were seven levels underneath the ranch working on construction. That is connected way down into those tunnel systems that crisscrossed the earth. What happened on September 11th that they admitted first time on the news? When I first started coming here and, and going other places, I told everyone that the earth is crisscrossed with tunnels and that there are many underground bases all over North America as well as in other parts of the world. And I also said to you that West Virginia was practically hollow underneath and that the largest city in the world is located under West Virginia. Well, lo and behold, that afternoon of September 11th, when Bush was being taken away in security, he, they announced on CNN that he will probably be going to the base underground in West Virginia. First time, I, I almost fell off my seat when I heard that. Only said it once. Then they said just a few weeks ago, guess what? We have a shadow government. Now, I've been using that term for a long time, so have other people. And everyone said, how ridiculous is that? Well, now they admitted it. But they admitted it in such a way that everyone said, oh, thank God there's a shadow government, because if they blow up Washington, at least there'll be people living under the ground somewhere that will be running the place. So how, thank God that there's a, a, a shadow government. That's how they, brilliant, actually, how they release the information in a way that you are so grateful that it's so they will be able to cut your head off and you write them a thank you letter. There's a country and western song that says, they're billing me for killing me. And it's the truth. And so, they're admitting all these things step by step. It happens that your Vice President Dick Cheney owns a corporation that builds pipelines. And the pipeline that he wanted to build goes across Afghanistan and goes all the way to Turkey and brings oil from other parts of the Middle East. So he has a lot to gain by occupying that area. Also about Dick Cheney, well, a couple of things. Some of you may have read a book uh, by a former uh, sex slave uh, um, who wrote a book called uh, Transformation of America. Trans, T-R-A-N-C-E, Formation of America. Have you read that book or heard of it? And she wrote in there that Dick Cheney was one of her handlers, or controllers, and that he was quite an evil man. Now, a while ago, a few years ago, I had done a lecture in, in Denver at the Global Sciences, and I happened to meet oh, the wife of one of the state senators of Wyoming, where Dick Cheney is from. And she told me, she knows Dick Cheney personally. He's come to her house. She's had dinner with, she's friends with her husband, and she said he's a horrible, horrible man. And she said if anybody knew what was going on underneath Wyoming, they just would not be able to believe it. And that came from the senator's wife, who, by the way, just wrote to me before I came here. So I haven't opened that email yet. And so, it has a lot to do also with 
the Denver Airport. How many of you have been there, the new Denver Airport? Not too many of you. The old Denver Airport was quite nice. It was near town. Then they closed it up and they built a new one 50 miles away, but only one road to get to it. And you can only get in if they scan your license plate coming in and out. And the runways are set up in the form of swastikas. And in the stained glass windows are swastikas. And the whole thing is designed like a tent. It looks like a tent, this gigantic tent in the middle of nowhere. And when you get out of the uh, gate, when you leave your aircraft, and you're in the, on the floor is embedded little reptilian creatures. And the tile, how many of you saw that? And there's words written, strange words in a strange language. And people think it's Indian language, but no Indian language that we know of. No one knows what they mean. And there's a big plaque in front of the, in the airport that says, dedicated to the people of Denver by the New World Airport Society. Now, at baggage claim 17, there is a mural about the size of this wall. And on that mural is a picture of a black woman, a Hispanic woman, a Jewish woman, an Oriental woman, and an Indian woman lying dead in their coffins holding dead babies. And standing above them with a sword in lederhosen is a little blonde boy with blue eyes. You could go see it. There's a picture of it here, but it's very small. It's very small. I'll try to find that for you. But it's right there in the open. Oh. Yeah, you can see, I don't know if you can see, they took little pieces of it. Uh, you can come up later and look at it. But it's, uh, yeah, here's the women lying in their coffins. And there's a little boy with the, the sword, the blonde boy. And, uh, Oh, yes, there's also a picture of a skull, a man in a, in, a, in a Nazi war suit and a skull with a sword trying to kill people. This is at the airport. Why are you getting luggage? Yeah, very pleasant. So the subliminal messages behind the subliminal, and, the, and here's another thing, though. There's enough concrete underneath the new Denver airport to build a six-lane highway from Denver to Chicago. Nobody knows why. And all the workers that built the underground have been sent elsewhere. They're not to be found. Long story there, but I can't go into that whole thing. It's a holding pen. In this country are five gigantic concentration camps, particularly in the western United States and in some parts of Canada. Each one is capable of holding up to five million people. In their estimation, they expect up to 25 million dissidents who need to be re-educated. And outside of Phoenix is a gigantic camp that contains crematorium. And outside of Portland, Oregon is a crematorium holding center, brand new unused. In 1997, the government accounting office ordered 200 million body bags. I don't know why. They also ordered the building of 240,000 train cars, each capable of holding 40 people in restraints. That's ordered and also being built in uh, Portland, Oregon. <coughs> you can look this up on the internet. They have a list of all the uh, government accounting office orders in, in the last few years. GAO. And look, yes, and look at dot org and look it up. GAO.org. Mm -hmm. You will also see in there, if you want, you can look up all of the federal executive orders that have been signed in the last 25 years. Every president in the last 25 years has signed executive orders giving away all American civil rights to jurisdiction of the United Nations. It's on there, you can look it up. And in fact, in all uh, federal or national uh, reserves, or like Yellowstone and Mount Rushmore, it no longer is a, a federal or, or American site. Now it says 
It is a global recreation site under jurisdiction of the United Nations. And so this is happening. One of my clients in Arizona, uh, who again I cannot name, um, but who's quite an interesting character, but who's quite an interesting character, the people that worked for this person went on a uh, bike ride or a dirt bike ride up to the northern mountains of Arizona, and lo and behold, in the middle of nowhere, were army tanks sitting. No one nowhere. And they would want to get away. No explanation. You don't ask when a tank is pointing at you. But just a week later is when all the fires started in Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado. They do this every year. Why? What did I tell you the last time I was here? I said many of these reptilians are coming up to the surface and they start fires to keep people away so that you don't see them. And now they actually had tanks in place to keep people away. The evidence is right under your nose and it's also in your pockets. And I've told you this, many of you, before. If you take out your one dollar bill and you look in the back, you will see, of course, you always win perhaps wondered why in the back of an American money would be in a, the eye of Isis on a pyramid with reptilian skin around it and a space because this represents the Illuminati and no one goes near them and then everybody else, all these layers of the masses underneath and under this is a banner that used to say e pluribus unum, one for all. If you read it now, it says novus ordum seclorum, new world order. It's on your money. It's on all, all, the, 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 all yes. Actually, when uh, Prescott Bush created the IRS, they changed that. But listen to me. Next year, they told you they're color coding the money. There's going to be blue and red. And so they've color coded everything. Now they've color coded the terrorist level of, of alert. They've color coded buildings in the cities. But Chicago color coded all their buildings. Uh, now everything is color coded. That's why it's important to know what color codes are. That's why I teach color coding for all these years. And everybody said, well, we're going to do with that. Well, now you know. And then when the stock market crashes, and it will, probably before the end of this year, there will not be a money system. They will take the money system and change it into a credit system. So whatever you have in the bank, you will get the equivalent in credits. Whatever you have in the stock market will be valueless. So. I'm not a financial advisor, but I will tell people, and I'm warning you, you better, if you have any significant cash in the stock market, get it out now, even if it's not worth what you put in, because it'll be worth nothing in a few months. There is a global ceremony that is being performed since 1945. It's a, called a global ritual. The first global ritual occurred in 1945. That global ritual was the symbolic, simultaneous destruction and creation of matter, which was the explosion of a nuclear weapon, which was tested first at the 33rd parallel in the United States. 33 is very important to the Illuminati. Most of you believe that the Masons have 33 degrees, but that's only for public consumption. Actually, Masonic levels go up to 42, which is why most major cities on the Earth are located at the 42nd parallel, north and south. Look on a map and just go across the 42nd parallel, north and south. Most of the major cities of the Earth are located within 100 miles of that. Atlanta is on the 33rd parallel. Denver is closer to the 42nd. Those are the two new capitals of the United States next year. Thirty-three, 1945, symbolic creation, destruction of matter, first global ceremony. What was trucked into the site at that time was an object with strange dimensions to it, and the dimensions measured exactly 
to what Ka the Kabbalistic rituals would refer to as a golem. I don't know if any of you have heard that word before. In Kabbalah, a golem is an artificial being who is created by the word of God, by putting something of the word of God in its mouth, to become a servant or slave to the master who creates it. So in that symbolic destruction and creation of matter, the Illuminati were effectively saying that they were the gods and they were creating a slave race. That's all of you. The second global ritual occurred in 1969, and that number is all significant as well. In 1969 was the hoaxed landing on the moon, which symbolically represented the unification of heaven and earth, male, female, god, goddess. That's why it was in 69. And that was, and I say hoaxed landing, because it was filmed in Area 51 in Nevada. It had actually not occurred on the moon. And the reason it didn't occur on the moon was because we already had bases on the moon since 1957. And if they were to actually take a camera to the moon and show you that, you would know that. So they couldn't do that. They had to stage it in 1969 and film it in Nevada. And if you look at the film of the moon landings that were supposedly taken over several days of being on the moon, and you superimpose them one over another, you will see all the places that they claim to have been are the same spot. You will also see the flag waving in the wind that's not supposed to be there. You will also see that if you speed up their slow movement on the surface of the moon, if you speed it up, it looks just like people walking on the ground like this, except they slowed it down to make it look differently. And even the way they showed the lunar module blasting off afterwards with the camera, created a concussion that could only have been available with an atmosphere. All these things are available to you if you want to look at that. In fact, I believe there was a documentary on that uh, not long ago on cable television. So that's the third and final global ceremony that's about to occur. Well, first of all, we have to look at how did this even begin? Who was the very first Mason? Officially. King Solomon. King Solomon was the first Mason. Why? Because he hired an architect to build the most magnificent temple in the universe. And when the architect was finished building it, it was so magnificent, King Solomon decided that he better kill the architect because he might build something more beautiful for somebody else. So he had the architect killed. Then he hired three assassins to kill the original assassin. Where have you heard that one before? How about the Kennedy assassination, 1963? Also involves three. An assassin hired to kill an assassin. There were actually three shooters, not one. And in fact, it was triangulated. There was uh, someone in the grassy knoll, yes. There was someone in the, in the tower, which was uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, who actually didn't shoot. And there was also the driver of the car. And if you look at the Zapruder film, and you look closely, and I have a copy of it, you will see the driver of the car leaning around with a gun and shooting the president. And you see the puff of smoke come out of the gun, and you see the president's head go back. He wasn't shot from behind, because then he would go forward. He would head his head went back. And that's why Jackie Kennedy went out the back of the car, because she was getting the hell away from the shooter. She wasn't going towards where the shooting was coming from. That would be stupid. If the shooter was from behind, she would have ducked down. She did. Have you not noticed before she died and for years afterwards, she's drugged out of her mind. I knew people in Manhattan that knew her, and you could not have a conversation with her. She was in La La Land all the time. She was so heavily drugged that it created the illness that killed her finally from the medication. She also had written her own memoirs, which are not allowed to be released until the year 2025. So why wouldn't they release her published memoirs? Because she would tell you this, and she will, but by that time it'll be too late. 
And so, what are we looking for? How many temples have there been? Well, there was the first one that was destroyed by the Greeks. Then they rebuilt it, and then that one in 70 AD was destroyed by the Romans. The Greeks, Syrian Greeks, same yes. culture. No, Solomon's was by the, uh, the, they lived in Iraq, the, um, the Babylonians, Babylonians, carried off by Babylonians. Uh, Nebu Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, that's where they went into exile. Yes, but they, they were destroyed. Not fully, but it was, because uh, when they came back, there was a little bit. But the actual temple, the physical destruction was by the Greeks. Yes, and, yes, and then the Romans. They were in exile in Babylon, and that's what I wrote the Talmud, or the analysis of the, of the Torah. Anyway, so there's been two temples, both destroyed. The idea for the New World Religion is to create again, here's the magical number three, the new temple. But what's the problem? The Rock. Rock is on it. Okay? So that has to go. The third global ceremony is the rebuilding of the temple in 2003. So how did the Jews now get, out, get into this story? How did they fit well, in? Well, look what's going on right now. Look what's going on in the Middle East right now. There will never be a peace agreement between the Israelis and the Palestinians. That will never happen, ever. They took a vote in the Knesset. It's just not going to happen, no, even despite any vote. The those who control this world will never allow it. But they will allow the destruction of the Islamic fundamentalists, which is why the whole setup for the World Trade Center was in the first place, so that the world would develop a hatred for the fundamentalist Islamic people. They also emphasized this in March of 2001, when they destroyed the Buddhist statues in Afghanistan that had been there for 1,500 years. This angered the Orientals. Now they also blew up the temple, the oldest synagogue in North Africa, they blew up in Tunisia. Now they damaged the Church of the Nativity. So they angered every single religion. Now who is this? Illuminati. The Illuminati that I'm talking to you about, Illuminati. Understand something. It wasn't destroyed, it was damaged. The Israelis fired uh, flares or rockets into it and started fires. And the Palestinians blamed the Israelis, and the Israelis blamed the Palestinians, and it's just, that's the way it is. And so, who is, who is the group that claims responsibility for most of the suicide attacks in the Middle East? But what word are they using? The Al-Aqsa Brigade. Where is Al-Aqsa? But where is it in Jerusalem? Yes. Mm -hmm. So, And every time you see CNN report or a news report from the Middle East, what is always in the background? Behind the Dome of the Rock is always in the background. It's being imprinted on you, waiting for your understanding of its destruction. And that's what's going to happen imminently. They will, they will blame it on Jewish extremists in the Middle East who, in anger, will blow it up. Where, when did the Intifada start? What, what enhanced this is when Ariel Sharon visited the Temple Mount mm -hmm. and made them all upset in front of the Dome of the Rock. What was going on? The Israelis were tunneling underneath the Dome of the Rock to get to the in, underneath area where they believe they will find the Ark of the Covenant. There's two, two Arks of the Covenant, an original and a copy. The original was kept in Ethiopia for a very long time. And in the 1980s, when the Israelis airlifted the black Jews called the Falasha back to Israel, they took the Ark of the Covenant back with them. But they punished Ethiopia because Ethiopia would not allow them to come and get the Falasha. 
And the Israelis have been asking for years. And so what they did was incite separate, separatists in the province of Eritrea, which is on the coast of Ethiopia, and the Israelis funded that and gave them money, and actually to this day now there is a separate country called Eritrea, which is south of Somalia, east of, of Ethiopia. And so why was it so important for all those thousands of black Jews to go back to Israel? Why? What do they represent? Who is their ancestor? Solomon. It's perfect. What was just born in Israel not long ago? A red heifer. They're suddenly finding accoutrements that were used in the temple that they thought they'd never have again. They're finding it. They're finding the plants that have the blue dye that they can use. They're finding oil that they thought they couldn't, from a plant they thought never existed anymore. They're starting to find everything they need to recreate that third temple. And when that happens, that is when the new world religion will be installed. And Jerusalem will become the holy site again. Yes. Yes, and that's why all these fundamentalist Christians are in there right now, waiting for this to happen. Channel 38 covers that a lot. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so, that's what's going on right now. That's what everything is gearing up to right now. The Chinese and the Israelis have a military agreement where they will destroy the Central Asian fundamentalists. It's already beginning. This summer, the United States and Britain will attack Iraq. And after Iraq, they will attack Iran, and they will go after Syria, and they will go after Libya, and Algeria, and Sudan, and blah, 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 all in a row, until there are no more in existence. And in this country, the United States has called into question Arab Americans and Islamic Americans particularly in Detroit, which has the highest Arab concentration in the United States. And so, this is the first time since Nazi Germany that a group of people have been asked to register and go under interrogation because of their religion. Of course, we did that in World War II with the Japanese, didn't we? We incarcerated all of them in concentration camps in this country. But they died, many of them. Big deal. The Palestinians say that about the Israelis. Not correct. Temporary or not. Would you like to be in one for a week? No. no they were there for four years. Not a, a long term plan. It was a reactive plan to the war. Why didn't they incarcerate Germans? Too many of them. Because we were working with the Germans. Oh, yeah. In Montauk, in World War II, German U-boats were seen entering Montauk Harbor and going underneath into the submarine pens without being stopped. And this is what the Illuminati are about. On a higher level, they are operating all in control of one government. There really is only one government. Countries are for public consumption. Most countries are artificially creative, including the United States, including Switzerland, including most of South America. All fake countries. There is no such cultures. They're artificially made. So this is all leading up to them dropping the facade and just telling everybody, hey, we're running the show, you're our slaves. And where are they showing you this? But in Cuba. Now what have they just done? They created an international prison in Guantanamo, and they have taken Afghanistan people, who maybe never knew what an airplane looked like, and incarcerated them 10,000 miles from where they live. And everybody says, that's okay, because they're from Afghanistan. The terrorists. The terrorists. But in Guantanamo are people from 35 different countries. And then what happened this week? Former President Carter went to Havana and made nice nice with Fidel Castro and all the Cuban people. Like nothing ever was ever wrong. Bringing Cuba into the New World Order and allowing it to become a prison island. Those people have not been charged with anything. 
What else have they done, especially in Europe? They took M M M uh, the, the Yugoslavian leader, Milosevic, from Yugoslavia to Holland. Why? He committed no crime in Holland. Maybe he didn't even commit a crime. What's international trade. International, ah, what's, so what has the UN created? The World War Crimes Tribunal. Any citizen of any country who is accused of being a war criminal can be, ta can be taken away from their country and brought anywhere that they feel a trial is necessary. No, he, he was set up, and even his wife is saying that it's all lies. It's a setup. Just like there is no Osama bin Laden, like you think. It's that he doesn't exist. That's why they can't find his body. Can't find a body that isn't real. And isn't it interesting, as they went from town to town in Afghanistan, the Taliban just happened to leave videotapes laying around with a big caption, Tape of Osama bin Laden. <laughs> Please play. That make, that's high security. People who want to hide who they are and be security minded, that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? That whole family, they're Saudi Arabian. Yeah. 15 of the 19 hijackers were Saudi Arabian. Most of the terrorist leaders are Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. Saudi Arabian is a dictatorship of one family. And then there's this new ad now. Do you see that new ad? What a wonderful country. Yes. <laughs> However, if you know people who live there, or service people who, who are stationed there, it is not such a wonderful <laughs> country. And they'll soon just chop off your hands and your feet just for committing the crime. Not a problem. This is who visited Bush and his ranch in Texas and demanded pressure on the Israelis and other people who were not being so nice to Saudi Arabia. And then Bush made a statement, yes, I'll do what they say. Bush, for the most, I hate to tell you this. Well, no, I don't hate to tell you this. But he's practically illiterate. Nothing is here. Nothing. He can't even read two words in front of him. See? He's totally mind control. And Laura Bush, have you ever heard her speak? Have you ever seen... Blink. Blink. She is on more drugs than Jacqueline Kennedy ever was on. Totally controlled. Totally. And on November of 2000, when you voted, and I've told you this perhaps once before, you would have gotten better results pressing the lever on your toilet bowl than you did on the lever on the voting machine. Because at least when you pl press the lever on your toilet bowl, you pretty much know where it's going. <laughs> yeah, you done. When you press the lever on that voting machine, it's probably nothing behind it. Because they're not registering anything. In fact, you know that they already had poodles that were registered to vote, and canaries and other animals all over the country that were registered voters and whose vote counted. Whereas servicemen overseas, their votes were thrown in the garbage. So what did they prove? And then they took it to the Supreme Court and the federal government. Well, hold on a minute there. The Constitution of the United States says the federal government cannot get involved in elections. In fact, the federal government is set up as an agent for the independent states. Each state has the right to print its own money and raise its own army and are, in fact, independent countries. <coughs> but somewhere along the line. And the federal government in Washington is supposed to be an agent only to deal with foreign affairs or continental issues. But somewhere along the line, that got changed. It got changed to where instead of you voting for elected figures and you telling them what to do because you voted for them and they represent you, it switched so now that you are working for them, and they're telling you what to do. When did that happen? When did that switch occur where you no longer are important, but you work for them? Is that when the shadow government came into being? That's underground? Anything that's underground is hiding from the light of day. Remember that. 
And now it's been brought to the surface and you're saying it's okay. And the worst is yet to come. Because when the stock market crashes, and it will, when that temple comes, when that dome comes down, and every Muslim on the earth gets incensed, there will be a free-for-all everywhere. And it will cause economic collapse, especially in this country. And what happens when the stock market crashes, and utilities fold, and there's no lights, and there's no gasoline, and there's no work, and there's no school, and there's no food, what are you going to do? And what will happen? I'll tell you what's going to happen. This guy is going to call the UN and say we need help because we don't have any troops left in this country to stop the civil disobedience that's occurring. That's because our troops are every place else but here. There are no troops. All the Illinois uh, civil troops are out, are gone. You know that. that. I put that on my website a few months ago. They're all gone. There's an emergency in Illinois. No civil troops. Only they'd have to call in soldiers and foreign aid. And that's what they will happen. They will call in the UN to stop the violence and the destruction in this country most of which will be under Chinese troops. There are already 1.9 million Chinese troops stationed around the borders of this country. They are in Panama, Bahamas, and Canada, and Mexico. In Mexico, in the mountains just over the border, the Mexicans talk about Los Chinos, who are just sitting there waiting. I have people in Honduras writing to me and telling me that the Chinese Navy is right there in Honduras inviting people to tour their vessels. This is not shown on American television. Panama canals are owned by the Chinese now. China owns the deepest water port in the, US, in the world, which is in the Bahamas, 90 miles from Florida. And all the parts of their Navy are there. I can tell you I just came back from China. And the troops there are quite in alignment ready to pounce at a moment's notice. You are being shown on television commercials with Asian characters. You are being shown people of importance with Asian of Chinese descent. Who landed in Chicago a couple of weeks ago? A seven foot tall Chinese basketball player okay, becomes an American hero. Every category of American life will be dominated by Chinese characters to get in line to accept Chinese troops. One more year. And then they will say that the United States is too large of an area to be controlled centrally, and they will split it along the Mississippi River. The Eastern District capital will be Atlanta, and the Western District capital will be Denver. Washington, D.C. will become an Illuminati ritual center, and New York City will become the global capital. That's why the license plates have on it now Empire State. It always was the Empire State. Now it's on the license plates. That's why Hillary Clinton became the senator from New York, so she can become the global senator. She doesn't ever have any background in New York State. She just moved there and became senator, like that. She had competition, JFK Jr and Rudy, Rudy Giuliani. He developed cancer and had to drop out. And we know what happened to JFK Jr. End of story. She was practically unopposed. You weren't really here last time I spoke. No. It was no accident. It was no accident. He was murdered. And and so was Egypt Air on purpose, so was TWA, so was Swiss Air, so was uh, Alaska Airlines. Hmm? There were seven people on it? What do you there were seven people on it? And yes, it yes, absolutely. Who, who were the people that were on those planes? Well, that's a whole other lecture, and I've already talked about that here a while ago, I believe. So I don't want to go back into it. Suffice to say... Any of that in the book? 
I believe some of it is, especially I wrote about Egypt Air, Swiss Air, TWA, yes, it, it's in the book. All, and where they all come from, JFK Airport, and where they all fly over, Montauk. You think that they would have noticed some similarities there. Well, every time I fly over that area, I clench my seat till we get past. But yes, they use uh, particle beam accelerator weapons based at Brookhaven National Labs to destroy the aircraft. Except Egypt, the air got the aircraft. Except Egypt, the air got a little too far away, and that was actually witnessed by a Lufthansa pilot behind them. The plane was actually hit in the tail section by a missile and started down. And what happens if you know about jumbo jet airliners? Uh, when a plane goes out of control, you turn off the engines and restart them. That's why they turned off the engines. He wasn't committing suicide. So he turned off the engines and restarted them, and then the plane started back up. And when it reached a certain point, the Lufthansa pilot reported, a missile blew it up out of the air. Gone. Now, if you were a pilot, and you happened to be Muslim, and you were flying a plane that was starting to crash, wouldn't you pray to Allah? Wouldn't you say, God help me? That's what he did. He wasn't committing suicide. In fact, he called his wife before he left, and he said, tell my son to meet me at the airport. I have brought tires for the truck, and I need help bringing them back home. Why would he call if he was going to commit suicide? Now, that plane originated in Los Angeles. It stopped in an Air Force base in the desert, and 33 Egyptian military personnel got on that plane before it went to New York. And when it got to New York, only one person got off. And the person who got off was a grief counselor. He was the only one that got off. And then they let the passengers on. The reason the plane was delayed arriving was because it made an unscheduled stop in an Air Force base. And you know the rest of the story. That's what happened with that aircraft. And that is why there are no bodies. Because it was obliterated. And they never brought wreckage up. It was gone. More to that story, no time to do that right now. And so I understand that all of this might make you feel unsettled. How do you feel about all of this? What do we do? What do we well, do? That's, New Zealand? <laughs> oh, you wouldn't want to go to New Zealand. In fact, they just had a big earthquake. And New Zealand and Australia are absolutely under CIA control like this. And I will tell you, what are you supposed to do? Well, after some of the lectures, I used to end at this point. You know, when I see people crying, I figure it's time to get out. <laughs> but that's not the point. The point isn't to instill fear, and the point isn't to make you upset, although it's good if you feel that, because otherwise you'll do nothing. You'll be the blind sheep, that are the sheeple, as David Icke calls you. And so the point is, and here's a big point, and I hope you listen carefully, none of this would happen if it were not for the victimization mentality of humanity that attracts the oppressors and the tyrants. You receive in life and create in life what you project out. The mind is everything. If you have fear and you feel like a victim, then you will be a victim. If you remove the victimization mentality, then none of this can happen. If tomorrow morning, all 6.3 billion people on the world woke up and had eliminated their mind patterns of victimiz victimization, the Illuminati would go away. They would, because they would have no one to, to be oppressing. But that is not likely to happen. Is it possible? Yes, anything is possible. Is it likely? No. In fact, I don't think it will happen for quite a number of years. But you have to start somewhere. Each one of you is individually responsible for being part of the collective. And so if each one of you works on eliminating the victimization mentality, and you teach that to others, like the commercial says, and so on and so on, eventually it will reach a critical mass that will spill over to the others, and then this will come to an end. But that's up to each individual. You're not going to win with violence. 
You're not going to win with committing suicide. You're not going to win with fear. But you will win with analyzing who and what you are and becoming that. And that's hopefully what I teach in my seminars and in my, in my lectures when I do healing techniques and mind pattern analysis and in the Healer's Handbook. This is what I'm trying to get across to everybody. Human beings use less than 10% of their brain capacity. That's 90% of your brain you're not using. Imagine what you can do if you open up even a portion of that. That's what I'm asking you to do. Open up the part of your brain you're not using and eliminate the negativity that in the parts you are using. And then all of this will turn around. So people ask, who's the hope? Every single one of you. Are there space brothers coming to save us? No. That's all an illusion. That's all disinformation designed to make you think if you do nothing and wait long enough, you'll be rescued. But by the time you realize you've been an idiot, it's too late. Remember that scene in Independence Day movie when all the New Age people are on the rooftop yeah. at the UFO saying, welcome space brothers, open the door and let us in. And the doors open up and they're cheering and then the first one's blasted away. And that's a message to all of you. You had a question. Uh, there are, what, 20, 25 people in this room. How many people is it actually going to take to uh, uh, slow this down or stop it? It's going to take over 50% of the Earth's population. Throughout history, there are times when large groups of people, the consciousness winks open. Um, maybe during the time of Jesus, Muhammad, there are other times throughout history. You get large numbers of people who will open up their consciousness, and depending on what's put in, will depend how the planet goes. Mm -hmm. Is one of these times coming now to, <coughs> will this be part of the synchronicity with what the Illuminati is trying to do? <clears throat> Let me explain something to you about that. There is no special time to do this. It could have been done 10,000 years ago. It could have been done yesterday. It could be done right now. It's up to each person. There is no special time when there is a mass illumination of, of energy. That's New Age disinformation. And you'll notice you'll get emails every now and then, or you'll get brochures that'll say, on this and this day at 6 o'clock, if everybody in the world tunes in to the Christ consciousness, all the Taliban will go away, and all the aliens will go away, and we'll be free. Well, who, who wrote that? That's NSA. That's targeting people to form group, group consciousness at a certain time so that they know when to target and enter in false information. All channeling, all channeling is from satellite transmission. All of it. And those of you who think otherwise are going to be sadly led into a path of destruction. They've thought of everything. They thought they have devices, video devices, that can take you and put you next to Osama bin Laden and have words coming out of your mouth supporting him. That's right. They can put transmissions into your brain that make you think it's your thought when it's coming from a microwave tower. They have thought of everything. They're not stupid. They're quite brilliant. And they're winning. Why do you think Bush has that little smirky smile all the time? Like he's hiding something. He's hiding something and you're so stupid because you don't get it. Plus the fact he's kind of dumb. That's what's going on. It can be considered scary, or you can consider it an opportunity to change yourself. Yourself, not him. People tell me, can't we all just pray for them and send them love? Well, love is an energy. I can love you unconditionally. Well, I can love you to death. It's like this marker. I can draw beautiful artwork on the board with it, or I can draw all over you. Same marker, different intent. 
energy, what are you going to do with it? Energy is energy. It's how you direct it. God-mind does not intervene. There is no such thing as divine intervention. God-mind is neutral. It allows all things. That's why how it knows itself. That's why you have free will. You want to burn yourself up in a fire? God-mind will let you do that. You want to become a holy man, live on a mountain? God-mind will let you do that. Free will. It comes from happening, you won't learn. It comes from your own older soul and your own mind pattern within that older soul. That's what directs the God-mind energy. Free will. Okay, we're running out of time. So... Thank you.